Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8.6. Alright, well, let's continue this. Yeah, just a little too fast. Okay, basic education investment. That is great. It's one of those core elements, but pushed too far forward, but allows us to research advanced education. But we're not going to let it linger down there in the red, because getting this will um, get more leadership, which will help with everything else. So we want that up at the top. Few, you know, fundamental things that that help with other things here. You know, we want up at the at the top. Make sure that it gets research as quickly as possible. So yeah, either it's moving too fast or too slow. Okay, um, rare minerals, no, not for you. Rare supplies for money, yes. For Japan, Iran, supplies for money, yes. U.S., the big cash cow, certainly. Also go with Poland and Argentina. Don't know if any of these will last. Belgium, Hungary, we give them money in exchange for, no, we don't want fuel from you. Oh, somebody stole our blueprints, don't we have agents? Yep, we've got top full priority there. Active spies, 10, that's the max you can have. Got nine over in Britain trying to steal some plans ourselves. See, I want them to steal something like naval plans, something that they're more advanced on than us. As you may note, some of these episodes are a bit longish. I sort of um, target for about 40 minutes for an episode. Some have been going to, you know, an hour, maybe an hour, a little bit more. Part of that is I sort of want to get through these um, peacetime periods because we'll see how quickly we put them up compared to Hearts of Iron 4 episodes to see where, where we go. But... Uh, you know how quickly you get through it but 
I figure if it could be a long time, you know, with, with me pausing like I am doing now, talking, that we get through a lot of stuff. Or it take a long time to get there if the episodes are short and we're only doing a few ever so often. So, yep. Proves ICs, but I will also should allow a decision to choose to see how we want to improve or we may have to wait for next year with some of those yeah we could do a little bit of a bonus over it no nope. balanced well enough got a cash coming in building up cash reserves And I know many of you are interested in, you know, seeing what I pick for various events and other things, but so if you, you know, so you do want to see the peacetime build up to the war, I understand that and all, but like now, if you're getting a little bit bored, just skip ahead a little bit. Ah, see, there we go. What do we have here? Okay, streamlined German police structure. This goes to some of the stuff I was talking about in earlier episodes. Okay, let's see the Ordungspolizei. The various police forces of the Reich are merged into the Ordungs, Ordungs, Polizei, Polizei, Police, or Pro, or Po. Um, prior to 1936, um, the uniformed police had been managed by state and local governments. Control passed to the SS after Himmler took control of the German police. Himmler expanded and reorganized the Orpo to deal with a wider range of policing and emergency response issues. Orpo battalions were deployed to manage traffic, water safety, public transport, to provide fire safety response and responses to organized air raid procedures obviously are precautions that's maybe a little bit further in the future than now um, guard infrastructure and communications facilities even serve as night watchmen for important factories between 1939 and 1945 the Ordunks Polizei um, maintained military formations trained and outfitted by the main police offices within Germany. The first such formations, the Order Police Battalion, were deployed in September 1939. Okay, this is an overview, of not just 36, clearly now. Along with the Wehrmacht Army in the invasion of Poland. Throughout the war, the battalions were used for various auxiliary duties, including the so-called anti-partisan operations, constructions of defensive works, i.e. Atlantic Wall, support of combat troops, police battalions, consisted of approximately 500 men armed with uh, light infantry weapons. 1942, the majority of these police battalions were um, reconsolidated into SS and police regiments. The formations were intended to garrison security duties, anti-partisan functions, and to support Waffen SS units on the Eastern Front. Okay. Um, I'm sh sure it's correct here, but I have also been looking in partially different things. Is that they, they mentioned in here, um, uh, employee transmit, provide fire, organize, guard, um, inf and communication facilities, night watchmen for important factories. Well, um, there was also um, factory guards that were armed. I don't think they had any particular police power. Um, their, their uniforms were uh, specific to the different companies. And um, someday it'll make it into some events that are sort of low priority. 
And part of the reason I hadn't really done anything when I was actively doing Hearts of Iron 3, um, they really didn't have a good effect uh, for them because the um, guard, security guard elements, like for the various factories, are way too small to be any sort of combat formations. You know, I'm sure if you take all the factory guards for Greater Berlin area, you come up with a couple of battalions of people, maybe, but um, they weren't really anything like that so much. Um, or any sort of combat. They were just um, watchmen, but watchmen with arms. And um, definitely as the war came along, they started to, to do that. Merger police forces and Ford the Orange Oaks. Pull it side. Pull it C. Pull it Or not. So revolt risk goes up. Don't know why. It goes up. Okay. Um, supplies. Party support goes. Gets better. Okay. I do believe we will get other events for um, the police. Now, the police battalions, um, they did a lot of mass killings in the East. Uh, not necessarily always Jewish, but um, you know, taking out good chunks of towns, people out and just shooting them. They were involved in a lot of that. Um, And so, you know, they they really, they were never really a frontline unit until at least um, the front lines were collapsing, you know. And as they said in the descriptions, you know, support the Waffen-SS or whatever um, when elements were collapsing on the eastern front, you know, and everybody's being thrown into the, into the front line. And um, there was also a fair amount of... Um, the Waff various Waffen SS divisions or other formation needing manpower, and since you're, you know, if you were, you know, units stationed in the eastern Ukraine, you've been withdrawn west because you no longer occupy the eastern Ukraine or something. Um, they were just breaking up the, the police units and putting the manpower into various Waffen SS type. Um, formations and things like that so there was definitely a shift at some point basically my understanding is is all police generals were also officers um in the ss when and i have some uh men that are i've got photographs of them in their ss uniforms and contemporaneously photographs in their police uniforms so when they were commanding their police units they wore police uniforms, these SS officers, but they would have a, an additional badge on their uniform if you can see them in large enough um, things that have an SS badge on them to show that they are full members of not the Waffen SS, but just the, L the SS. And so they were full members of the SS. But the general, uh, to the best of my knowledge, drew to the end, the, 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 the general police were never, um, formations were never, SS formations. Like, say, manpower was scraped up and shoved into divisions as things were collapsing. That's sort of a different thing, but it's so they, the SS controlled the police. The police weren't the SS. They didn't need to make all, meet all the racial standards and other things. Okay. Ordering the battleship Bismarck. Now, let's hopefully this goes well. Because there's a bug in it, and I... It's... I don't think Third Reich events causes the bug, though so maybe it's involved in it. I don't know, um, because I, I know this isn't one of my events here, and it's a um, sub-mod event. So, been informed, you, you click yes, and... Hmm. Maybe that worked, maybe that didn't. It would take a lot of steel. Okay, we went to the negative thing there. Good thing we weren't on it. Okay, we've got high popularity.
which means we can research more stuff now. Of course, I like to keep high popularity all the time. You, you, well, not that you can't, but we don't have the control over this because you can see, well, internal factors. Sometimes they're negative, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the modders have been able to figure out how to what affects all those things. So, um, I don't know how to to do it. Meaning, if it's like, hey, you just need to throw more resources, and then you can always make the choice. Goes, hey, keep internal factors for for positive for high popularity. It's going to cost an extra. 20 ICs and I may go uh, no that's too much I'd rather have um, you know I'd rather not force you know force it down or something popular at a particular time you know it's a choice thing and sometimes maybe some of the choices just get unreasonably expensive I, I'm good with that if you think that that is what is needed as a mod developer now I can decide I don't like your mod but that's partially what we're doing here, and I'm, I'll critique, you know, talk about my own mods, and I critique other, other mod makers stuff and what I think of it. Generally speaking, with um, Lexi and Revolver Helds and the D-Worms, I approve of most things going on. Okay, we'll do this. There we go. So we fill that up. I'm going to wait for this. Into, okay. Now we're back to positive stuff. Okay. So, um... So we wanted to see the plans there and start a new session. Okay. Now, um, we need to have at least this amount of money. Sort of waiting for some of those other things to hit too. So I want, I want. I want to make sure I have enough money. So we're sort of holding off on that for just a moment. Okay. Um, there was a lot of control going on during the, the time period. And this is part of the SA um, development. And um, we're used to seeing in various movies and maybe a, a favorite of many of ours, um, Where Eagles Dare, you know, the Clint Eastwood, um, Richard Burton movie where they go, you know, into Nazi Germany, in many other case places, you're always seeing these sort of sentry boxes that get, um, you know, trucks rammed into and whatnot as they blow through barricades. And also, of course, a lot you'll see in um, Hogan's Heroes stuff. I grew up watching that. Okay, I just thought this this was interesting when I came across it. Um, standard sentry box um, designed to. Um, you're generally supposed to stand out in front of it unless it's like foul weather or something and then you can get inside of it um, and you can see the, the the front is sort of standard there's a photograph of one you can see the little hole there that's not really apparent that's so you can look out and see who's like approaching from either side and presumably there'll be a hole on each side um, so you can watch who who has come who's coming and different organizations had different um, paint schemes on their sentry boxes generally for the army um, they were you know the black red and white um, uh, sort of chevron -y patterns or whatever um, zigzags or however you want to say that well for the SA is um, this box it looks black but it isn't and that's a guy in an SA uniform it's, the, it's in blood red and I searched and I searched for um, 
a color photograph of of a of an essay um, sentry box. Couldn't find one anywhere. So, if any of you guys are ever thumbing through a magazine or sees in any source a um, a period photograph, I want a period photograph, a color one. I, I figure they got to exist somewhere. But of a and it looks glossy, sort of a glossy blood red um, uh, sentry box. I'd love for you to scan it and send me the photograph. That'd be cool. Um, sort of update this thing. But that's sort of that. And that was just you know come out. So um, this and also shows the one of the functions that the SA continue to to do is maintain security. Um, the sentry boxes that specifically set up for the SA. Um, were for SA facilities, um, SA campgrounds during like the Nuremberg party rallies. They would um, off various areas, you know, sort of outside of the town, have big, you know, campgrounds where various SA units would be um, set up and, you know, check your passes or whatever going in and out of the various sections. They would have these boxes set up. So, yep, cool. Okay. Um, the Sudeten Deutsches Party. That's um, obviously, if you watch my earlier um, things, is the German speakers um, along the border regions of Czechoslovakia that had been obviously um, part of the um, Holy Roman Empire, German pe speaking culturally people. And then once the Holy Roman Empire um, sort of split in two between the German Empire and the Austrian Empire. Um, ended up in the Austrian section, and then eventually ended up their own ethnic minorities. You know, they had been a part of the ruling class ethnicity of, of the Austrian um, Empire, but not that they necessarily, you know, they're, I think, mostly relative, rel you know, obviously there's some cities, um, Carlsbad here, um, and whatever. And a lot of the elites, not just German Germans, but a lot of elites, I understand at this time, you know, in the 30s, in Prague, um, spoke German um, because left over from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That sort of to have an education sort of meant that you spoke German instead of just Czech. So there was sort of social status. But a lot of the these people, my understand my understanding, are sort of you know country people. You know, not necessarily so rich or so elite. So these weren't like the ruling class but these were people that went from being a part of the majority population or the um primary culture of at least of the austrian half of the austro-hungarian empire <coughs> excuse me um now into a minority status and they didn't like it um and so this is just setting that up okay now, since we're doing so well with the Hindenburg flying back and forth and around the places, we are ordering um, LZ, because um, the Hindenburg is LZ-129. This is LZ-130, the Graf Zeppelin II. There is the Graf Zeppelin currently at this time flying around um, Germany, uh, the older one, but they're replacing it with a newer, bigger one, so we're going to start production. Again, I don't give you the chance to, to not because... Um, anyone looking back knows not to do um, Zeppelins. So that's, you know, this sort of thing. Okay. Um, uh, Schmeling's victory over Joe Lewis, the American boxer, sort of celebrated in, um, in Germany. I'm keeping mostly, most of these short, not all of them. <laughs> um, 100... Or 1,000th anniversary of Heinrich the First death. Um, this was a big celebration. I've seen a bunch of other photographs of it. There's sort of a coin with his image on it. Um, the wreath that Himmler's um, laying. Um, like I said, I've seen a bunch of other photographs. Mostly people that are SS. Though you see some brown and other, um, you know, SA and some other types. Um, they're at it. The big, um, the big takeaway is um, Heinrich is sort of the, at least within the, um, you know, generally thought as to being sort of the founder of the, the first Reich, the first German state that's German and 
all-encompassing of the German peoples or whatever, and I'm sure it's there's mistakes in that, but that's what he sort of remembered as, and that's what Him Himmler was promoting it, but also Himmler made a big deal of this because Himmler, and I don't know how wide this knowledge was spread at the time, I don't think it was in general public consumption, but Himmler considered himself to be a reincarnation of Heinrich, Heinrich the First, and partially I think because he was, you know, his parents named him Heinrich, so, um, so that's why it's important to the SS and multiple things. Okay. Um, here we go. This is um, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1939. The Nobel Peace Prize should be awarded to... Um, oh, Carl von Ostrensky. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So, we can... Um, Well, he was a German jur journal journalist due to prison term he could not receive it yet. But now, with the end of his imprisonment, now um, we've called I've called it um, prison term because prison um, I I walk a very close line um, with stuff, and of course. I'm sure some of you who've watched this series, your eyes have sort of tricked you into believing that um, some event images might have a swastika image. It's just because you've watched so many documentaries, watched, looked through so many books that your eyes are, and your mind, I should say, is just filling in swastikas where they should be. Because, of course, there's no mods allowed anywhere on the forums uh, for any Hearts of Iron game that include any swastika so there's no swastika in third reich events you, you you're hearing me now of course there are no swastikas in the third reich events and these droids are not the droids you're looking for so um i have to walk a very fine line of what i say and do um so we call it a prison term which technically it sort of was but he was in a, in a concentration camp so um Concentration camps, the, you know, the main main problem there, the term is camp. Gets close to death camp, which gets is a definite no-no with um, things going with um, Hearts of Iron and his podcast and his recent um, public thing for the um, Paradox um, well, event, what do you want, um, fan meeting, whatever um, thing that they had. Uh, was asked about, um, again, by an audience member. Um, and then a few of the audience members, other ones, just sort of knew some of the answers, looked down and shook their head. But about having the Holocaust in um, uh, Hearts of Iron. And Podcat's answer is, is it goes nowhere good. Um, he doesn't want to... Um, make a game for people who want to run concentrate death camps or, or what you know to, to 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 inflict the holocaust and to force players to i don't know role play or whatever to deal with it you know those like people like me or everybody 99 percent of you out there you know oh yes sign the order to send off millions of people to their death no you're gonna say no no but but there isn't a choice to not know so you know there's it just goes nowhere good for them and i understand that this is why um and so you know a concentration camp what is it concentration is just a camp in which you concentrate people um and so and because of things they're also very touchy on prisoner of war stuff and partially because the term camp is in there um you know so Sometimes concentration camps are um, have very little fencing and um, are therefore like refugees, if you will, and purely, you know, a refugee concentration camp, just so that the people aren't wandering around, you know, going around the country, you know, they're, you know, homeless because, you know, could be Syria in our modern sense or could be post-World War II concentration camps. Um, but the people you know, can't necessarily go home because, I don't know, they, you know, 
some ethnic minority from from uh, the Soviet Union, and if they go back, they're not going to be welcome. They're going to go into other prison camps or be shot or something. And so, but they're not let out into the po the general population. So, so they are they are concentrated in one location, but it's a very different thing. Um, when as um, oh, I'm trying to remember the movie. Um, saw part of it um, recently. Uh, forget what, but um, some of the um, people. Ex a man and a woman or whatever escapes from Germany into Switzerland. And when the Swiss, um, one of the, one of the people in it was either like a, I forget the man was an American or a, um, British guy or something. I think an American or something. He was planning on getting to the, getting back to the embassy and they were going to smuggle him out of Switzerland. This is while the war was still going on. But the woman was, um, a Jewish, I believe in the thing. And again, I'm, I'm blanking on what movie it was, but the, the sort of scene, and the, the Swiss authority, well, we got to take you off to the, um, I think he even said concentration camp, but and sort of saw the look on her face. And, oh, it's nothing like the, you know, the ones you're used to. It's just a place for you to live, you know, and that's, you know, and there were a bunch of concentration camps in Switzerland because various refugees from various countries, sometimes Jewish, but sometimes just, people fleeing bombings or whatever that, that made it into Switzerland. And they were housed in camps. And they, yes, they had wire fences around them and things. And a lot of them, like I know in Switzerland, you could get a day pass to go out to the local town, but you had to come back at night or whatever. And if you didn't come back, you were put on a list to be found. And, you know, and then once you abuse the privilege or something, they wouldn't let you back out. You know, it's nothing, you know, so the, the purely that it's a concentration camp, in and of itself isn't bad. It's just because it goes on. So I use the, the prison term. It's technically right. Um, though the prison was made up of barbed wire and not concrete or something. Um, so, but, so now, so he's allowed out. Um, tried to convince him not to accept the prize, but without success, he insists to travel. So also, the, re um, the Gestapo recommending not or recommend not allowing him to leave because it will damage Germany's reputation. So he is being honored for his anti-Nazi, basically, um, press stuff. So we can refuse departure, um, which gains some dissent here and things, or we can allow departure. Um, both gain dissent for different reasons. But you can see um, you get better or worse relations with Sweden and Norway. We're going to refuse departure. We're going to take the historical path because uh, it follows on to some other events that are um, interesting and, and important and drives the narrative. So um, you can um, make your choice here. Okay, uh, sign the... Assign the technicianess Nolith. Um, Tino, as I, I sort of know it, um, T N or T E N O. Um, it's sort of the technical emergency corps um, of engineers, technicians, specialists in construction work, and these would be um, basically any sort of. Um, technical people, people who would put up um, telephone poles and systems and wiring, not just the people who stick the poles in the ground, but who would know how to wire up um, telephone systems and into the buildings, you know, it's for the time period, pretty technical type stuff. And um, I'm not going to read this whole thing. You, of course, can either pause it now or whatever. But these continued on through the through the war. They were very important. Come in after bomb, dam you know, bomb damage um, and repair things when they weren't obviously, you know, when the before the war is getting going good, you know, they're, you don't have to bomb repair bomb damage. They're just improving the technical infrastructure of Germany. And it was as opposed to like the RAD, which have, like I said, is mostly like farm labor, but the RAD did other things. And um, if you look at the, um, you know, the DAT, which this is sort of, as you can see by the, um, the cog symbol, it is, I think 
Does it say if it's specifically a subgroup of the daft or not? I don't know. Um, but which are more factory type workers. And then you have um, organization tote, which are a bit more just construction labor. These are sort of the technical people that fit in between some of those other groups. So we can get civil defense improvements or not. So we're going to go with that. Okay, we'll turn manpower back to the pool. The three. This is from building the East Prussian um, air bases earlier. Okay, uh, we will give them money for rare materials. Mm, okay. Okay, tag der SA der A group in Nord C. Um, obviously, this is in um, Bremen, the North Sea here. Um, just, and this is a photo from that event. There's the poster, there's a commemorative um, uh, medal, or um, uh, what do they call them? I'm blanking on it again. Um, Uh, um, and I am blanking on it. Uh, they were sort of like day badges. Um, tinnies, that's right. Not They weren't all made out of tin, but they were called tinnies. They were, all, generally speaking, not always, of much lesser qualities than a proper um, uniform uh, badge that they would wear. I think... Um, depending on the situation, the participants like the SA may wear the badge on the day. A lot of the badges would be um, worn by visitors on the day um, of the event. And then you just sort of go into sort of like people collecting later Olympic pins or something else. They just sort of go into a collection of stuff. You wouldn't wear a, um, a large collection of these things. These weren't particularly uniform items. And they were sold. They were cheap. But um, they were also, um, you know, I don't know, sold for, for 10 cents, but cost them 3 cents to make or, or something like that. You know, in, in the, you know, 10 cents back then was, you know, a meal's price or something or whatever it was. But it was it was cheap but profitable to to raise money selling those things. So that's sort of just an example. And these things are going on all the time, all over Germany, at least in the better um seasons of the year if you if you um understand you know, meaning they're not happening in the dead of winter or whatever generally speaking i'm sure there were days out for skiing you know or whatever and in, in, in that kind of thing so yes now we've been hit pretty hard with several events for a lot of our steel and coal okay another sort of um sad or tragic um, event, which I don't think was included in my last playthrough journey because I think I made it after it. Lux. Um, what's his? Um, Stefan Lux, a Czechoslovakian Jewish journalist born in Vienna. Um, he sees, like uh, Frankfurter does, um, that the Nazis weren't just your average we don't like Jewish people. Um, I've talked about earlier that in parts of Europe. So um, he goes into um, the League of Nations um, just in the gallery outside of it or or press gallery. Oh, okay. It was a regular in the press gallery. He during the, okay, right, and called to the general press secretary by name and cried, um, this is the last blow and shot himself. So he shot himself in um, uh, Switzerland. Um, so that's where the League of Nations headquarters was um, as a protest against the Nazis. So this is another Jew making a stand. Instead of attacking somebody else, he tries to um, call attention to it by committing suicide in July 1936. 
And um, one that I don't think is well remembered now, maybe he's remembered better in the Jewish community, but um, one of the people who tried to get, call attention to this situation. Okay, well, we'll build up more. Okay, well, first let me, both for you as a viewer and me as a person who hasn't played in a long time, through this part of the game. Well, we got um, small entertainment shows, small heroic tales, and small news and politics that I put down just as the already existing at the start of the game infrastructure of Germany for this element of um, the game that I think is standing ahead of most. I know there wasn't anything like this going on at this time in the U.S. Now, once the war starts within the radios or and other sorts of uh, elements of U.S. Um, government propaganda out there to um, motivate the population, Definitely happens, but that's a uh, once wartime builds up. Um, there's a little Hollywood, a little bit, but not nothing to this. There is sort of already going at the BBC a similar, though not nearly as extensive as the Nazis. I don't know if there how much government messaging, you know, meaning a government because the BBC is owned yeah, basically by the British government um, to one degree or another. I think still to this day. Um, mainly paid to do their programming out of their licensing fees. Um, I don't know if there's government-owned radio in France. You know, it's different. It's one thing having a press secretary and have a propaganda o uh, office um, type thing, but it's another thing to own radio stations and dictate what gets broadcast out of them in an ongoing way. I don't really think, and again, I may be misunderstanding the situation in Russia, but I really don't think radios were as widespread um, ownership in Russia, so I don't don't think it has nearly as big of impact. So, and Italy just don't know how much really at the time. In Japan, again, I don't think there was nearly the widespread radio um, ownership in Japan at this time. So, this is having Britain and having France have a I mean, Britain and Germany having a bit of a head start over it, I think, is historical and good. But now we have to decide what we, what do we want to do. Um, reduce consumer goods. That's probably what we're going to do. Because right now we don't need territorial pride, national unity organization regain rate, because we're not combat. And we gain territorial pride and ruling party. Now, ruling party support. That would be nice, but right now I think I would rather have because it, um, each step up costs more and more, so we'll probably get um, news and politics standard one next. So we'll do entertainment shows, which will reduce um, this. Okay, well, we can already go down to 42. So it's 42.37. So let's come in here and entertainment shows. It's taking effect yet. No, 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 no fuel, no fuel, no fuel, no fuel. Okay, um, as I talked about earlier, um, the big one there, and it's partially bigger, I think, because it's closer to the camera. But these um, two ships, the Hindenburg um, and the Graf Zeppelin um, 127, uh, fly together over Frankfurt. Um, Graf Zeppelin is too small and slow for the North Atlantic service yet because of the um, blue gas fuel just capable of carrying out um, 
the South Atlantic route. So that it's able to go to, um, to South, South Atlantic with some stops pretty quickly. So that's what it's doing at the right seasons currently, but can't do the North American thing. That's why we're building a new Graf Zeppelin. Now, I've since this um, original, and I just sort of did this because it's something we don't see today. I, I don't think they have them anymore around here. Um, for a while, I, in, in greater LA area, we had a the Goodyear blimp and then the Fuji blimp. But those blimps are 20% um, the size or less of either of these ships. But they're sort of impressive to see up in, in the sky. And sometimes I you could see both at once back in, I think, the 90s. But I don't think either of them are flying anymore. And it's sort of an advertising Fuji film or Goodyear tires um, that they're gone. But to see something as big and huge floating above your head as two Zeppelins at the same time, I thought was just an impressive thing. So that's why I put this in here. Now, since I this doing more research, this is tied into an election campaign in 1936. And they were using, um, and so I've used this image, but using some election campaign material and go into it. Um, and there, so they were flying over these cities and doing special, um, you know, send a, send a letter or a postcard on it and get special stamps for collectors. Um, they were dropping leaflets out over the city. So it was all part of a, a um, one of the political campaigns. So. It's changed a little bit for Hearts of Iron 4. But I just, it's impressive. Let's, I haven't yet got the effects of. The radio shows. The. July agreement, basically, is what that says in English. Julie, um, Coleman or whatever. Okay. Um, some background on this, as I've learned more and more in looking into German-Austrian relations. Um, Nazi terrorists in, I think it was 33 or 34, shoot um, and kill the um, president of... Um, Austria and they did so to the best of my understanding uh, not on any um, these are the Nazi party existed in Austria not on any German to the best again best of my understanding it could be wrong or whatever but not on any uh, German authorities um, orders it was just locally hey let's let's kill our leader and take over the country kind of thing um, so um, they do that because of this, um, the Nazi party's banned, and a great many of the um, national socialists in um, Austria are um, put into um, concentration camps as, um, or internment camps or whatever you want to call them, again, how we label things. Um, so basically it's banned. Well, a fundamental core element of Nazism is that all Germans should be under one unified government. That is just something that is fundamental at its core. So Nazis or, or Austria's existence is fundamentally incapable of existing with Nazism. So if you're Nazi Germany, you can't have an Austria. As I said earlier, Franz von Papen is currently the, at this time, the ambassador to Austria, and he's working to bring about unification, Anschluss. Um, as part of this is they um, get the people out of um, the camps, inclusion of two national socialists in the cabinet, but still the, the Nazi party is still forbidden. Now, um, Kurt Schesnig's, um fatherland front in um, Austria is a fascist government or party. That's their, their flag. They are fascists. They, um, and this is again, which comes 
and it, and it was quite popular. Uh, he and his party were quite popular. The Nazis, when it finally did come down to it, great many, uh, and part of it is, is, as we can see, some of the voting certificates, the pressure on to vote yes for things. Uh, that's why they get in the 90% plus. But um, there are still a lot of Austrian nationalists um, there, of course, Austrian communists, and there's Austrian um, social democrats, and whatever else. They, I'm not necessarily saying that they're at this time like the Communist Party's loud. I don't believe it is, but you know, people with those viewpoints. But the the most dominant, um, largest party or whatever at this time was the Austrian Fascist Party, the Fatherland Front, um, and it is supported by Mussolini because still in 1936. Remember, um, Italy's strongest allies were Britain and France, and Italy was relying upon that. Mussolini was relying upon that. He gets upset once this happens. Uh, he goes to war with Ethiopia, and they sponsor an embargo against them. So that starts, only now in thirty-six, starts to push Mussolini into the hands of um, Hitler. All United Na all um, League of Nations nations are banned from trading with um, Italy and basically any commodities except one and probably the one that would have been effective, oil. Um, and so when I've redone a lot of this over for the Hearts of Iron Four version, and so while Mussolini's at war, he's under a trade embargo for every nation out there that's um, a member of the League of Nations. Two nations that aren't members of the League of Nations is one, one of the sort of, or the founding principle of the League of Nations, though never was a member of it, the United States. The League of Nations was a Woodrow Wilson idea. Um, people are shocked in this day and age that, you mean the United States is no longer part of the Paris Accords? That can't be. No, they can't just leave. They can't do this stuff. Hey, the U.S., um, you know, um, and what the that EU guy um, and people, oh, you can't, you know, you can't just leave this stuff. You can't just get out of it. Hey, you know what? It ain't a treaty. The president signed the thing. You around the world have, have called it a treaty. Um, the U.S., they tried to call it the Paris Accords, but it's not a treaty. So we can leave it anytime you want, because to be a treaty, you have to do one special thing in the United States. A, the president or the um, local ambassador or the um, secretary of state can sign any damn piece of paper he wants with anybody he wants. Yeah, the president can right now, Trump can get on an airplane and fly to Moscow and sign a, sign a piece of paper that says, America now belongs to Russia. It has zero, and I do mean this, zero meaning until it is ratified by the Senate of the United States of America. The League of Nations, uh, and Wilson pushed for the formation, President Wilson pushed for the formation of the League of Nations in the um, wake of World War I. He basically abandoned all of his 14 principles to get all the major powers to form the League of Nations because he thought that was going to be the um, multinational um, world government at least to the extent of maintaining peace in the world, that the nations were going to band together and form this League of Nations. And so he gave up um, all kinds of principles of, out of his 14. You might argue on a few, and I don't know in detail, but basically he gave up all of his 14 principles to get them on there. He signs the, you know, yes, League of Nations, get everybody on, comes back to the U.S., and the U.S. Senate goes, ah, no, no way. And he had nowhere near... Um, enough support to, to get it past uh, the American um, government uh, signing on to the rules of the League of Nations. The U.S. traditionally has been, um, we are a free nation. We are a sovereign free nation. Um, this is just the way it is. And World War II did get us into the United Nations, but even that, you know, is, and <laughs> trust me, there's a lot of lot of feeling in the U.S. to leave the United the, the, um, the UN, 
<laughs> you might be surprised, um, world populace, that if we were to hold a vote, a national vote on the UN, of those who would actually show up to vote for it, uh, we probably would leave. The populace would probably leave um, the UN. So the U.S. Senate said no to the um, League of Nations. So that was one of the nations that continued to trade with Italy. And the other major nation at the time that was not a member of the League of Nations. Now, let's remember that Japan, I don't believe, had left yet. They leave eventually. Um, but maybe they already had. I don't know. I, I, I looked that up at the time, and I forget right now. Is Germany. And the, so Germany um, trades with Italy. So Italy starts moving towards um, Germany and alliance. Now, before this, and including at this time in 36, I know I wasn't going to pause too much, but this is stuff I didn't cover in my last playthrough, so that's why I'm going into more detail on this. Italy is using fascist Austria as a buffer state. Mussolini was expansionistic. He wanted to recreate a form of the Roman Empire. I don't think in his wildest dreams he ever thought um, Londinium was going to become part of um, the new Roman Empire, but he did see it as a Mediterranean Empire. Whether his um, sending troops to the Spanish Civil War, he thought it maybe as, I don't know whether he thought it as early stages of an eventual, um, you know, having fascists take over and join with Italy and becoming one new Roman Empire. Not, I don't know if it was that extensive. Obviously, he was looking at, at um, Yugoslavia. He was... He invaded Greece to, to, to enforce it to be part. He invaded um, uh, Albania. He wanted to get Egypt in. I think he also wanted to get Turkey in. But So he was definitely looking into some of this region as expanding, definitely expanding the um, Italian Empire, the new Roman Empire. Now, he was worried because of these borders here what Germany wants to do. I don't think he ever had any design territorial designs on Germany, and I don't think he, so long as Germany itself didn't appear to be like a communist country or something that was going to do harm to him, I don't think he really cared. And this is, we're talking in 36 now, and things change over time. But he's worried that um, this part of Italy currently was had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and this is German um, uh dominant region in here, um, maybe almost exclusively. Um, Trieste had long been an Austrian, um, uh, or the major Austrian uh, port. This, I believe here, was the sort of Hungarian port. But major, the major port for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it had a significant German-speaking population as part of that. Now, I don't know the population of Trieste at this, you know, in 36, whether most of those Austrian speak, German speaking Austrians had fled to Austria or whether they were still living as part of Italy, I don't know. But he was definitely afraid that a powerful Germany would want to take some of his territory. So he wanted Austria to be a buffer zone. So he set up a um, an alliance of the, the three powers pact. Um, three Ps um, is how it, it sort of thing um, uh, shortened to of Italy, Austria, and Hungary. Now Hungary under um, Admiral Hathi is much more of a nationalistic um, regime. The the Arrow Cross Party doesn't have a majority um, sentiment in Austria. I mean in in, hung, in Hungary, so it is not a fascist nation, but it is a conservative nation. Remember, Austria is sort of the nation that first put the proposal to Germany of forming the anti common turn pact, and that comes out of Austria um, eventually. So it's a very traditional anti-communist nation. So Mussolini is working with these three powers to set up a defensive alignment at this time. So um, Shishnig is the successor to, oh man, I shouldn't even, because I'm blanking again on, the, the, the earlier one who was, Adolphus, who was, um, see I remember, who was assassinated by the German, 
So this is an agreement pushed by von Papen to get um, the Germans and the the guys that the ones that were directly um, involved in the killing of it. I believe had already been executed. This was just a bunch of internment camps of a lot of just members who would wouldn't have had prop, most likely had any direct knowledge or participation in the assassination were let out. And so this had been what two years on or something three three years from when they were originally put in. So they're let out now. So we improving our relations with Austria. Okay. Establish the underground oil lubrication plant and storages. This is fairly new to me. WIFO. Almost Wi-Fi, but not quite. Okay. Already in 1934, the German or the Reich government established the Rich Schaftlich. I'm sorry. Uh, whatever. I'm not even going to go with the next word. Because quite honestly, some of these things, I, is it for Schnug? See, I don't know where to break up the uh, the, the phonemes. The, the syllables are sort of, well, syllables can be multiple phonemes, but the phonemes in the English. Or WIFO. I can do WIFO. Um, Electronic Research Society as a camouflage company for the Reich's secret rearmament policy. In the case of war, the Reich administration expected to face a blockade by its enemies who would aim at cutting off the Reich from essential imports of crude oil. The Reich Minister of Economics intended to counter this by increasing the economic cooperation with Romania to access large quantities of Romanian oil production to produce synthetic fuel from coal conversion. Thus, WIFO was founded by the Reich Ministry of Economics and was Supposed to procure, uh, supposed to procure, store and produce strategic rare materials in order to secure the high logistics, high or secure the um, secure the core logistics of the Wehrmacht. The main task of WIFO was construction and run large underground storage and production facilities for fuels and oils. In mid-1936, construction of 10 secure underground storage and filling facilities commenced, each with a capacity of 100,000 to 200,000 cubic meters to ensure the Luftwaffe and Wehrmacht would remain operational and fuel. When the war broke out in 1939, WOFO storage facilities uh, were filled with 80% and in 1942, more than 10,000 workers were employed with WIFO. WIFO gradually received the task to organize the transportation of fuels of the Wehrmacht visa railroads and shipping. Wow, I wish I would have had this information much earlier in the development stages of Hearts of Iron 4 to show to podcast. They are, um, they don't like this. And I agree that, um, you can basically, um, which we're not obviously, we're 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 having a, a surplus, daily surplus here, but you could set up and produce enough supplies and sell enough supplies, um, you know, and there's good reason to be doing that, people. But the question is, is do we? Because right now we we started out with about this is about 20 needed supplies, and we were producing about 44 here. Um, it shifts a little bit with different things here. Um, we need a lot more reinforcements, and we're not doing that. Um, but do we shift to even more supplies to sell more? And a lot of this is um, also because we're selling supplies too to get money to pay for um, rare materials here. But there's definitely a strategy to import enough and have large stockpiles. And they didn't like the idea of being able to stockpile enough to basically go fight your whole war without any um, needs of, um, you know, securing more. Uh, now, 
uh, it's been a long time and I haven't seen it. I have the book here, but I haven't been able to find the passage in the book. But one of them in the documentary is called The Prize. Both the book and the, the documentary are called The Prize. And it um, was done towards the end of the 20th century. And basically, the great prize of the 20th century was oil. And it concerns the um, how oil affected history and um, what nations were doing to get it and such. And part of it covers World War II. From one of the things, as I remember it, and I could be wrong, Germany, um, it's in its victory uh, over France secured basically one year of its operational needs of oil for Germany. So had they had either the the French destroyed the oil reserves before Germans could get a hold of it or had, you know, there was, you know, better defensive line and had they just sat there like World War I, Germany would have been out of oil much much sooner at the operational levels because that up uh, that um was a big cushion now of course they were still importing oil from ploetsky down here and they were um making more and more um, synthetic oil factories during this time period um and expanding all that because they had plenty of coal but it would have been a much without taking that french oil the small reserves or relatively small reserves in um, the Netherlands and Denmark weren't much. And unfortunately, Germany gets too much from Denmark because in this game, because it's getting all the excess shipped in from its colonies here that really would have just been sitting here in the ground and not being taken out. So, um, the, and they don't like this. And so I understand the idea that um, what was driving Germany was the need to secure oil. Now, part of it, as we can see, is they secured France's oil and it kept them operation. So some stockpiling, which is not in Hearts of Iron 4, and as like I said earlier, we're going to compare 3 and 4 a lot during this series. Um, Germany, uh, you know, did, uh, cons secured large resources. I know the U.S. was had a stockpile reserve of oil, though it had plenty in the ground, but it was more sort of um, ready supply to convert. Generally speaking, although... Um, you store it as oil and not as um, gasoline. Gasoline isn't a good to store long term. Um, oil can be burned in um, power plants as just oil. Um, and then I do believe in a lot of the large shipping usage, um, sort of light, sweet, crude, if you will, because um, you can get some oil that's um, has lots of sulfur in it and other things that could really mess up your machinery. But if you get good quality oil or barely processed um, oil, not noth nowhere um, gone through to um, process things, gasoline, but a little bit of processing uh, oil, you can run in a lot of your ships. You know, so it's like looks sort of like black crude in the, in the ships just from you know burning the oil. So you know it's stored as oil. So. And so whether you go through the mechanism, so if you don't want to have huge amounts of reserves of oil, but you should at least be able to, in a way, have that as fuel. And so they need it to be able to stockpile to represent this and other um, elements of stockpiling of fuel, whether you, you technically do it as oil or you do it as um, fuel, either way, within Hearts of Iron 4. But it shouldn't be, oh, hey, we, we can, you know, wait till 1940 and we'll have so much oil that we can go four or six years without, without any problem. Well, no, they couldn't. You know, they had their own, which, which is this, um, stockpiling. They got a hold of France because France was also stockpiling in case of war because um, it had faced German U-boats in World War I and knew that they would would or could be facing them in World War II, and most of the oil was imported to to France from other places. Some of them are in their colonies, but a lot of them were from other places for France, so France was stockpiling. You know, they could have been getting them from Indonesia or, you know, because um, I don't think there was very much in most of the French colonies like Syria that they were pulling out, but getting either from, like, Iraq or Persia. Um... But they were, even if they're coming from their own colonies, they were still having to get it into France. 
I don't know about Britain stockpiling a fuel. I don't of oil. I don't think much of that was going on. I just don't know. You know, in, in an industrial scale like this, I'm sure that you know, if for some reason uh, no ships were showing up to to Britain for for 30 days or 90 days, the the oil, gas, whatever system within it would, would be able to handle Britain's needs. We're talking substantial stockpiles. Um, but this is very useful information. I'm glad that I have this now, but and I may use this in arguments in, in the future. I'm going to figure out which mod this, this is from and steal the um, image and the text from it to argue about stockpiling of fuel that, again, shouldn't be an endless stockpile of either fuel or um, oil, but should be a thing and should be able to be stockpileable and, um, you know, so that's great. I'm really happy to find this. Okay, well, we'll lose a lot of supplies. We can sort of afford that. A lot of money, thousand money. Good thing we sort of went through the the radio thing. And get some coal to oil conversion gain. Good. Oil refining gain. Good. Okay, we'll do this. Also sort of hoping, thinking that doing that will lead to other events that continue to develop along that line. But I had not heard about that um, specific organization before within Germany. Now I just looked at the clock and I've been talking. Okay, um, we'll do this and then end this episode here. Um, Hitler Youth Bicycling Trip. Well, I found this photo um, in a, of a group of these guys over here. Hitler Youth Boys visiting Britain. This is a local British youth group. I don't know whether they're Boy Scouts or some other sorts of youth group. Um, and basically these are... Hitler used it bicycle to Britain. Obviously, they did. They you know, got on a ferry to get across um, the Channel to go to Britain. But there was a lot of these things going on. Um, this is just one of them that made it in the local newspaper in Britain, um, and and they were going on to basically all the countries around Germany, you know, one one extent or another. So we can send them or not send them. Um, we're going to send them. It just costs money. And, the re and again, back to my design philosophy is things happening overseas, yeah, outside of Germany, cost money where things happening inside cost supplies. And this is, represents the money because if you're going overseas, you're going to have to spend some of your, you know, your money. You're going to have to exchange currency. So we'll do that. Okay. So this is where we're going to end this episode. It's gone on too long, I know, but um, just want to try to get through some of these years. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for liking the videos. It really does help. I do appreciate it. And, of course, it really also helps if you comment um, on the videos, just even saying it was good or it was okay or whatever. That helps, too. Um, or random gibberish, even. that That's appreciated as well. Maybe I'll make sense of it or maybe not. Um, just want to thank you all for that. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.